Uh, dear colleagues, dear guests, uh, I wonder what I could say in 20 minutes about 200 years. Uh, so I thought that it would be better to make a shortcut and discuss few elements of Greek history just to explain how Greece emerged as an independent state. Secondly, to talk about the complexities of its identity. And third, to refer uh, with some more detail to its position in international relations and international law. So when the Greek War of Independence started in 1821, the post-Napoleonic world was still taking its shape. The Greeks not only frustrated the status quo and the assumed stability of the order of the time, but they also carried the revolutionary fervor of the French Revolution in the heart of the Ottoman Empire. In that way, they revealed the deeper weaknesses of the Ottoman governance, what would be later called the Eastern question as to the survivability of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And this Eastern question ended with the demise of, of the Ottoman Empire in the aftermath uh, of the First World War. Still, the Greeks lost the war of independence. And they could not create a national state with their own forces. Greece became an independent state with the assistance of a foreign intervention in 1827, which uh, is considered as the first major practice on humanitarian intervention in international law. Uh, now, what about the emergence of the identity of the Greeks? First, let us um, understand a basic fact distinguishing Greece and the other countries of Southeastern Europe from the rest of Europe. Between uh, 1453, the year in which Constantinople uh, fell in the hands of the Ottomans and 1821, that is something less than four centuries, the Greek space was part of the Ottoman Empire. The Greeks did not enjoy the cultural achievements and social changes of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. There were no museums, no significant works of literature or art, no universities and no philosophers, scientists or thinkers, thinkers in the Greek space during these centuries that have changed Europe. Greece remained in what we call Middle Ages until the early 19th century. Interestingly, is the timing of the Greek Revolution. It is the same year in which uh, the uh, Latin American revolutions started, 1821. And there is not a direct relationship, but still there is a link which is the instability of Spain and Portugal uh, after the end of the Napoleonic uh, Wars. And there is a deeper uh, link uh, with regard to the character of, of the Greek Revolution and of the Latin American revolutions. First of all, the big difference, the Greek Revolution was a post-imperial, uh, led to a post-imperial state. Uh, the Latin American revolutions to post-colonial states, but there are many similarities and a number of points between the two. In the first place, as the Greeks developed their identity, their national identity of, uh, since the end of the 18th century, uh, they began to feel as an occupied people. And there, a factor that has played a role has been the institution of slavery. We are not aware of the fact that slavery was not invented by the West. There is a continuity in the institution since the ancient times. The Arabs 
and the Ottomans have maintained uh, the institution of slavery for centuries, and they never seriously uh, questioned it. There is a very nice uh, book by Hakan Erdem, Slavery in Ottoman Empire and its Demise, 1800s until 1909. It's a great book, and it shows precisely what was happening in the Ottoman Empire. So slavery, the sense of being occupied uh, by, by a foreigner, uh, has created a sense of, uh, of struggle, which is more than struggle for a national state and more than struggle for, uh, for freedom. It is also a struggle against uh, an empire functioning uh, as a colonizer. Here, I want to make sure that we understand that there is a difference between empire and, and, uh, and uh, on land and uh, colonial powers. They are not the same thing and the phenomena are different. However, there are some similarities that should have been more uh, explored. Uh, let me go to the humanitarian intervention because it is a fundamental uh, element of the discussion. Many theorists have said that the three powers, the British, uh, the French, and the Russians, intervened in the Greek uh, uh, War of Independence and helped create the Greek state because that was uh, somehow uh, uh, an intervention against Islam. Uh, this is uh, an interpretation which is misguided because the main point which was, which linked the Greek War of Independence with a transnational movement which was called Philhellenism was not the religious dimensions, on, uh, but the ancient Greek connection. So this uh, ancient, the, the idea that a nation uh, is again awakened uh, after 2000 years, this, this is what uh, uh, brought the romantics and uh, the, the activists uh, to the public for at that time. The Greek, uh, um, the London Greek Committee, which was established in 1823, mobilized people and mobilized liberal politicians in Britain and uh, based on uh, the relationship with the antiquity and a contribution to this movement was also the, uh, the Elgin Marbles uh, uh, exposition uh, in, uh, in London in uh, uh, a few years uh, uh, before uh, the starting of, of uh, the War of Independence. Uh, there was a, an exhibition uh, in uh, uh, in London of the Elgin Marbles around 1816, and this prepared uh, the, the public opinion for what then later, a few years later, became the Philhellenist movement. Uh, in uh, 1827, uh, France, uh, England, and Russia concluded the Treaty of London. In there, they decided that uh, an allied interposition uh, in the war uh, between the Greeks and the Turks uh, was necessary for three reasons. Only the third one uh, was the, uh, the sentiments of humanity, which were linked to the slaughter of the Greeks by uh, the Egyptian army and to the information that uh, the sublime port planned to uh, transport all Greeks to Egypt and have them uh, there as slaves, so that as, as, as a final solution to the Greek problem. This information, which was disseminated by the Russian, does not seem to be accurate. It was logistically impossible to do that. But still, it was an element of the public sentiment uh, and of the sentiment of, of humanity. But even more important, the number two reason was about the stability of Europe and uh, the impediments to maritime commerce caused by disorders and acts of piracy in the archipelago. This shows uh, actually that humanitarian intervention has always a link to what we call the peace in the sense of the order. And the order is not only the protection of individuals, even from genocide, 
the order is bigger because it destroys economy, it destroys the maritime communication, uh, and therefore it destabilizes the economic system. And that was a main point in the Treaty of London. Uh, then a few months later, in October of the same year, that was the naval battle of Navarino, in which the, the united uh, fleets of the three uh, great powers destroyed the Ottoman fleet and opened uh, the path to the Greek independence. So let me uh, now uh, go to the second topic, which is about the identity, because the, there are many identities uh, in uh, regarding the, uh, the Greek uh, people and the Greek nation uh, over the centuries. Um, actually, the modern Greek identity started to be, it was born at the moment of transition from the Byzantine to the Ottoman Empire, but it remained practically neutral for, for a long time. Uh, here we should distinguish between two identities, one which is called by the Greek word genos, which means a sub-imperial identity, and the ethnos, the nation, which is the national identity in our sense. The two identities coexisted for a very long time. The genos meant uh, the Greek Orthodox identity under the head and under the leadership of the Patriarch of Constantinople and under the administrative and political leadership of the Greek elite of Constantinople. This Greek elite was part of the Ottoman uh, governance system and a Greek uh, dynasty had governed parts of what we call today Romania and uh, Moldova for one century. It was the, the areas of Bessarabia and Wallachia. They had Greek, uh, Greek leaders uh, acting as representatives uh, of the Sultan for one century that ended uh, in the Greek Revolution because the Greek Revolution started from this uh, areas of Romania. It was started by the, uh, the, uh, the Greek elite that was governing these areas. And this shows how the genos and the nation started to have a, a rapprochement. But anyway, the sub-imperial uh, identity wanted to have a control over the Ottoman Empire from within as a Greek Ottoman. Uh, empire, of course, this uh, failed, and then the national identity was able to stabilize itself. So um, the conflict between uh, the uh, universalist sub-imperial identity of Genos and of the national and the particularist national identity had an importance in the international relations of Greece throughout the 19th century. Uh, there were two political ideas uh, uh, linked to some sort of irredentism. Uh, the first was the so-called grand idea. The grand idea was to reestablish the Byzantine Empire as a Greek national empire. And the second was the so-called Helleno-Ottomanism, which said that Greece and Turkey must ally themselves because they have a common enemy, which were the Slavs. Ultimately, the nationalist idea, of course, prevailed. It ended in the um, Balkan Wars of 1912 and 13 into the doubling of the Greek national territory. Uh, and then in 1922, into a total defeat of the Greeks, which uh, lost uh, uh, Asia Minor. The army was totally destroyed, uh, a part of it remained and was able to negotiate uh, the borders of Greece today through the Treaty of, of Lausanne. Uh, but in the, in the Asia Minor uh, War, uh, the Greek army, which had uh, reached very close to Ankara, uh, dissolved within a few weeks in 1922. Uh, and the whole population that lived in Asia Minor for, for thousands of years uh, had to return to Greek, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as refugees in, in, a, in a situation of, of uh, 
uh, total despondence. Uh, but, uh, and I would like to add uh, another element of the Greek identity, another element of the split identity, the Western and the Eastern, one uh, which uh, one part of, of the Greeks were uh, have had turned throughout the decades and these two centuries to Russia uh, as an Orthodox power, the others were uh, had turned towards the West. The conflict was very strong occasionally. The Communist Party since the 1920s represented uh, the Eastern identity uh, until the end <coughs> of, <coughs> of the Cold War. And uh, uh, traditional political parties were uh, <clears throat> or had always turned to the West. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, we had a resurgence of the Eastern identity shown in the sympathies of the Greek population and the Greek establishment to the regime of Slobodan Milosevic, which uh, received assistance from Greece. And uh, a number of Greeks had also participated in the armed conflict and they were uh, they have taken part in the genocide of Srebrenica. This was the extreme moment of the Eastern dystopia. Uh, all this, uh, this split was terminated uh, in July 2015 when the left government, uh, the leftist government of Greece agreed to the terms of the European Union for the refinancing of the debt. Since then, the question has been resolved. Uh, let me come quickly to international or international politics. In the interwar period, Greece was a very active player in the League of Nations and in the Permanent Court of International Justice. Nicolas Politis uh, was one of the, of the most important international law scholars of his time and also a diplomat and politician. <clears throat> uh, Greece was involved in at least three cases before the Permanent Court of International Justice. Uh, first is the case on the <clears throat> interpretation of the Greco-Turkish Agreement of 1926, which was a rather an advisory opinion on 28 of 1928 on a procedural question. The second, however, was an advisory opinion on the so-called Greco-Bulgarian communities it was the exchange of population between Greece and Bulgaria. And there, the court gave a very detailed and very accurate definition of a community in the sense of a minority. The definition of minority is in this advisory opinion of the Permanent Court of International Justice of 1930, Greco-Bulgarian communities. And uh, finally, there was an advisory opinion on the minority schools in Albania of 1935, in which the court uh, decided that uh, the, the claims of Greece that Albania had violated minority, the rights of the Greek minority in Albania with regard to education were uh, founded because Albania had uh, nationalized all schools and didn't let the sufficient space for schools of the minority groups. And this is an important decision also for our time. If we inverse the situation, can specific religious or other groups have their own private schools in our society? This is a big question. Now, the Cold War may have started in Germany through the question of reparations, but the first big battle of the, of the Cold War has taken place through the Greek Civil War, uh, whose uh, most important phase was 1946 to 1949. Uh, the official beginning of the Cold War was the Truman Doctrine, actually, where the Americans pushed the Soviets by saying that we're going to support Greece and Turkey. Turkey, of course, did not have any civil war, but Greece had, and the United States replaced Britain as a country protecting uh, the, the Greek sovereignty. So the importance of Greece during the Cold War, during the Cold War was enormous uh, because it was at the border between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. The, 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 the Greek Civil War is mirrored in the Corfu Channel case, uh, the first case of the International Court of Justice, 
which is between uh, Britain and, uh, and uh, Albania, but the real reason behind it was the uh, show of force by the British in the Corfu Straits because of the support of Albania to the uh, Greek Communist Party. So the British wanted to, to show that they are there present. And so the, this judgment shaped somehow the, the low force for the initial period of, of, of the Cold War. Uh, a second judgment, important judgment of the Cold War period was uh, on the Aegean Sea Continental Shelf Judgment of 1978, at the time when the Greek-Turkish antagonism on the Aegean Sea had started, because oil has been discovered in the Aegean, the oil was limited as it proved to be, but the dispute, which has been very intense uh, at the times, has continued since then. The ICJ decided that it had no jurisdiction on this, uh, uh, on this dispute. In the post-Cold War period, uh, the two uh, judgments affecting uh, Greece, directly or indirectly, has been the, uh, the Greek-Macedonian dispute before the International Court of Justice, Firm versus Greece, 2011. Greece, by vetoing uh, the admission of, um, uh, of Macedonia into NATO, uh, breached, according to the International Court of Justice, the agreement, the interim agreement of 1995 between the two countries, uh, that they would not block each other's uh, uh, membership into international organizations. However, this, this judgment shows how impotent a judgment can be for a very simple reason. You cannot impose any rule on what an international organization is doing. Since that time, Greece did not ever say again, I veto. Uh, Macedonia's uh, admission, it said, oh, the country does not fulfill the conditions of our organization. So if you argue that way, uh, the, you can circumvent uh, this, uh, this kind of judgment. And the second case, uh, it is the case Germany versus Italy on war reparations, Greece intervening, and uh, we know how the, the whole thing has ended. Uh, now, in the recent developments, uh, the Greek uh, a state and society had faced two major challenges. One was the financial crisis, we have discussed it sufficiently in this institute, and the second is the migration crisis and the response to the Turkish effort to push migrants towards the EU through Greece. As you understand, and considering that the northern borders of Greece are closed, Greece cannot accept any uh, any any migrant flow. It's impossible. It's a country of 11 million people just coming out of a financial uh, crisis. Imagine 800,000 uh, migrants being assembled into Greece into a short period of time in uh, 2015. This happened, but the migrants uh, were able to move to the north through the Greek Macedonian border, which was still open. Now the northern borders are closed and the whole thing uh, is not anymore impossible. I conclude with one phrase that Greece has over two centuries has stabilized a Western identity, has overcome the structural problems of the Ottoman origins, but also suffered national catastrophes, foreign occupation in the Second World War and a devastating civil war. Uh, however, the country seems to have an incredible degree of resilience and it's now coming out of this crisis. And uh, we are going to see uh, how it will develop in the future and whether this, uh, this, this uh, the current uh, relative stability can become sustainable and can change the country uh, in its essence. Thank you very much.